So today we're going to discuss about radiology of the pediatric chest. Um, this lecture is meant for the medical undergraduates. Um, and um, we we'll underwent the pediatric posting, um, but that can also apply to everybody else. Now, we will cover um, plain chest radiograph most of the time. Um, also, I will touch a bit on the computer tomography, ultrasound as well as the magnetic resonance imaging. Um, plain chest radiograph remains the basic for evaluation of the chest um, and often it can be and it will be the only radiological investigation that is necessary for the management of a child and most often we use the frontal view uh, it's either anthroposterior or posterior anterior um, in evaluation of chest radiograph occasionally we will use other view but not as frequent and or other imaging modalities that may be necessary. What are the indications for imaging the, child, uh, the chest in a child? So children always present with some sign and symptoms. For example, shortness of breath, cough, um, and don't forget about the cardiac uh, sign and symptoms, for example, the sinuses, because um, often all this uh, symptom will lead to the evaluation um, when using chest radiograph. Um, chest x-ray has a little bit of, um, you know, um, uh, radiation, but however, CT scan um, has a lot more radiation. Um, there's a potential radiation burden on CT scan. So that's why we reserve CT scan um, uh, for further characterization of lump brain camera whenever we detect the lesion on chest x-ray. And also, whenever we see a metastatic lesion on chest X-ray, the child uh, most of the time or may will go to a CT scan. Uh, whereas ultrasound, which is a bread and butter of um, uh, in pediatric radiology, is there's no radiation involved, and it's used to localize the fluid effusion and also to guide fluid aspiration or biopsy of the mass. And MRI is basically reserved, even reserved, because uh, MRI, even though it does not have any radiation, but it is um, uh, requires longer period of uh, imaging time, uh, which sometimes can go up to one hour, and, and most of the time in children, it will require sedation. So, um, so it will be reserved um, to look for medicine lesion because MRI is a very good soft tissue contrast. And it is also reserved for investigation of the congenital heart um, or in any great vessel anomaly. So um, whenever you approach a radiograph, so the um, basic radiographic densities that you need to know, because some of the radiographic densities represent certain structures. Uh, and this can um, not just apply um, in the chest, but also in other radiograph in all over the body. So whenever you see things that is loosened, or we normally see as uh, black, then it can represent air or fat. And whenever we see opacity, or it, uh, on the radiograph we see as a white, it can represent a lot of a a lot of things. For example, the fluid, blood, soft tissue, or even if it's more opaque, then it may uh, is represent the calcium as well as the bone. So it goes with the anatomy as well. Now, um, this is a child um, with a normal chest x-ray, so you can see that um, anything that is loosened is actually the aerated lung um, with an intervening uh, vessel which is like more opaque, so you can see this is a normal uh, appearance. Um, and if it's loosened but slightly more uh, opaque, then it can represent the fat within the subcutaneous tissue. And uh, Opacity, um, as I said, it represents soft tissue. So look at the metastinum. So most of the metastinum is opaque because it is um, a combination um, of heart or a great vessel uh, within that. And if it is slightly more opaque, then it most of the time represents the bone, for example, in this clavicle, the ribs, as well as the vertebral bodies. So don't forget the infradiaphragmatic, which is like this one. This is the liver shadow, which is also a soft tissue. So that's why it is opaque. And an air fill um, stomach. So that's why it is lucid. All right. 
Okay, there are specific features that you will encounter in children um, on a chest radiograph that is quite unique for children. For example, the cardiothoracic ratio we take it at 60%. Um, and you have to understand that thymus is still present during the childhood, so the thymus will be present in the superior mediastinum and it can be seen on chest radiograph. And whenever the child have a deep inspiration, you will see that the trachea is will kink to the right, and that is a normal finding um, on a chest X-ray in children. And whenever we um, identify the pluriffusion, the appearance of the pluriffusion most of the time will be a lamellar effusion. I will explain that later. So look at these two radiograph. Um, this is a child, um, I think, uh, age one years old that have this um, you know a, an opaque uh, structure that um, triangular shape it looks like um, a seal right so so this is um, a seal sign that represent a normal thymus in the superior uh, mediastinum and why is it is normal because um, uh, you can actually see a lucency uh, um, underlying it so that represent the aerated lung which present behind the thymus and at the same time, the trachea, uh, the airfield trachea here is very well delineated. It's not being compressed or it's not being displaced. So that means there is no mass, no abnormal mass in the superior mediastinum, but instead it's just the um, thymus which is not yet involved. And sometimes thymus can um, be hyperplastic because of infection. So it is some sort of like reaction to the infection itself. And it can be as big as this, uh, but again, you can still see the lucency be, uh, behind this uh, thymus represent the aerated lung, and at the same time, again, the trachea is not shifted or it's not being compressed. So that is a normal thymus, and normally this happens in a more neonatal period, um, and of course, we know that um, as the the age goes up, and you know the Thymus starts to involve and it becomes fatty, and by the age of eight years so old, it will in, uh, shrink. Okay, um, I just want to describe what is the difference between posterior anterior and the anteroposterior. In posterior anterior, um, normally patient uh, will stands in front of the image receptor. So this black line is the image receptor and it will facing the image receptor and the x-ray beam will come from posterior so that's why the posterior anterior is all about and look at this um, this is the body habitus um, and this red circle is the heart and that's the vertebral body so whenever the x-ray beam has come and you will see that you know the the heart is being projected this width on a x-ray as compared to uh, in anteroposterior view, because normally this happens in patient that is uh, on supine position or in semi erect, patient could not stand or it's not cooperative to stand, and you put the image receptor at the back, so at the behind, so that's the vertebral body, and that's the that's the height, which is slightly more far from the image receptor compared to the PA. And when you see that, uh, that means there is a bit of magnification of the heart size and this is um, and this is the width of the height that is being um, projected on the image receptor and it's slight is bigger than the PA so that's why we take a cardiothoracic ratio of 60% um, uh, limit in an AP view considering the magnification now when you see um, this kind of um, effusion this is an alamilla effusion so what does lamellar effusion mean is that the fluid um, has tracked in, uh, from below and going towards the apical and it gives rise to this kind of appearance. Compared to an adult, okay, if uh, let's say an adult we take an radiograph um, and, it, and most of the time it is in erect position, then it will give you the classic um, blunting of the costophrenic angle. And um, this is when the fluid is being um, accumulated at the depending most portion of within the pleural cavity. But in a child, we normally take radiograph in supine or in semi-erect position. And at that time, the fluid is enough 
time to track from below towards the ethical and when you shine or you give an x-ray beam and that's the initial sector then you will definitely see the pro effusion as a lamellar effusion okay before um, I go further um, just want you to remember there are certain um, way of approaching a radiograph and one of the basic is that identifying or uh, characterizing the abnormality and on chest radiograph there are several radiographic abnormalities um, that I've listed here um, that um, can be the appearance that you will see and you will um, narrow down the differential diagnosis based on the appearance so before I go further I think I would sh definitely want to um, recap the anatomy of the lung because um, different radiographic abnormalities uh, will signify pathology in different structures in the lung. So the basic um, formation of the lung is by, by the secondary lobule, and you see that you know there's a bronchiole that uh, will end um, into a bunch of alveoli. Okay, and then um, this um, there is pulmonary artery that accompanies it, and this bunch of uh, alveoli uh, will be outlined um, or margined by an, an interlobular septum which is uh, the supportive tissue um, and that is the secondary lobule and within this interlobular septum you have a pulmonary vein and the lymphatic vessel now whenever there is an hyperinflation so hyperinflation is basically the most common chest radiograph uh, findings um, that you will see in pathology uh, this basically indicates air trapping within the lung parenchyma, within the alveoli. So when you see a hyperinflated lung, that means um, you the signs are uh, you will see that the cardiac silhouette is a bit narrow, okay, in relative to the hyperinflated lung, and as if the heart is hanging, okay, and then the diaphragm is depressed, you know, because of there's a lot of air trapped inside the lung, uh, and giving that kind of mass effect and you see that the diaphragm um, is uh, uh, below the uh, beyond the ninth posterior rib so if you count one two three four five six seven eight and nine the normal um, volume lung volume should go reach until this level but if it goes beyond the ninth rib then it is a hyperinflated lung most often it is due to infection uh, of a uh, small airway inflammation causing small airway inflammation, viral, atypical, or it can also be due to an allergic reaction from a bronchial asthma. Okay, so in adult, you will have um, a communication or airway drift between the alveoli, like this one, or between the alveoli and the bronchioles. Okay, so whenever there's an obstruction here, then um, this air will go on an non-pathologic pathology alveoli and you know you don't have the air trapping but in children you have the air trap and you you do not have the um, communication you don't have the the airway drift we call that as force of cons or canal of lambert and because of that whenever there is um, inflammation of the airway swollen airway so when during the inspiration the air will enters the alveoli Okay, that's fine. But whenever during the expiration, um, the uh, alveoli that has a diseased bronchial, um, the air cannot uh, go out because you don't have an airway drift that will compensate um, the, the air volume within the alveoli. So in a normal bronchial, um, non-diseased bronchial, the, there would be reduction in the volume of the alveoli. But if it's disease at bronchial then the air will trap and causing the hyperinflation appearance okay um, what about linear or interstitial opacity this linear interstitial opacity is a pathology that present in the interlobular septum in the interstitium so interstitium as we know it covers from the peribronchial region down to the alveoli so whenever there is a pathology there's a fluid or, or pus in the region of the interstitium that's why you will look it as a line linear okay or we call it reticular opacity 
and we cannot um, the sign of it is that you cannot delineate the vascular marking very well because of the inflammation adjacent to that and also there is peribronchial cupping basically the wall of the bronchiole is thickened and this is caused by infection or chronic um, infection or bronchiectasis so just imagine this is the normal um, chest x-ray you can actually see the vessel very well but in the interstitial fasti um, because of the pathology within um, the interstitium then you will see a lot of lines that um, reduce the definity of the uh, vascular marking um, and you cannot delineate the vessel um, on its own okay so yeah you um, and an uh, another um, example and this is a normal uh, you 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 can't you can't really outline the peribronchial but if the peribronchial is thickened so you can outline it um, and it's thickened and that's what we call the peribronchial cuffing okay so again um, diaphragmatically to show that the pathology is in the peribronchial in the interstitium and it can go um, towards the um, alveolar as well okay now um, for this case, um, if we magnify it, then you will see that you know this um, opacity, linear opacity, extends towards the um, lower lobes, and as if there is you know uh, two lines parallel to each other, so that indicates a dilated bronchial with a thickened bronchial wall. In the case of bronchiectasis, so this is a CT scan that um, clearly show the bronchiectasis, but you can't really diagnose that on on chest x-ray but you can suggest presence of uh, that dilated bronchial okay so we move on from linear to now alveolar opacity so alveolar opacity is more patchy looking it's opaque and it's normally the pathology is in the alveoli okay so what we see is opacity as well as a bronchogram okay and most of the time it can be caused by infection um, bacterial or viral or even fungal okay so uh, that's the airfield um, branching uh, bronchioles that happen to be within the consolidation why is this happen is in a normal anatomy you will see this um, as a bronchiole that ends in, in the alveoli but in an alveolar pasty then you will see that as a very opaque alveoli um, and the airfield bronchiole is within the opac opacity so that's why you see the the airborne program within the opacity okay which indicates consolidation most of the time pneumonia now in a consolidation how do we determine the location of the lesion okay i.e which look okay and why is it important well to localize the lesion um, or a consolidation based on the look is that we will be able to narrow down the differential diagnosis because certain disease have a predilection um, a, 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 a affinity for a certain parts of the lung and it can also be as part of the preoperative planning, okay? Because the surgeon will want to know which loop that um, the surgeon wants to remove, and at the same time, um, in a chest withdrawal therapist, this is a very um, good information that they would want to know, uh, because they, it will help in the postural drainage. So um, it, they can um, know how which loop that they they will definitely remove the mucus from just by looking at the chest x-ray so again i have to emphasize to you the basic of radiographic density because that will definitely help you in interpretation so before i go move on so um, uh, just to recap the normal anatomy the right lung has three lobes the upper lobes middle lobes and lower lobes okay so this is the frontal and that's the lateral view of it and these lobes are being uh, separated by fascia so that means upper uh, the lower lobe is separated from the upper lobe and middle lobe by an oblique fascia that runs from the posterior to the anterior whereby the upper lobe and middle lobe is being separated by a transverse fascia okay so you normally see the transverse fascia um, uh, on the ap all right uh, whereas on on the left side you only have two lobes the upper lobe and which is bigger and the lower lobes again being separated by oblique fascia but you won't see the oblique fascia on AP but yet you will, you can see that on lateral view um, because it extends from the posterior obliquely to the anterior and this being separated 
okay by uh, the upper lobe and lower lobe so with that knowledge you can apply that to the normal anatomy in the chest radiogram okay because um, for example in on, on the right side you know that the transverse fissure that you'll be able to see on the frontal will divide the right upper lobe from the middle lobe and also the lower lobe whereas on the lateral you can see that okay that's the oblique fissure and that is the uh, the transverse fissure the left on the other hand only two lobes as i said so um, you don't see much on the ap but on the lateral you will definitely see the oblique fissure that divide the upper loop and the lower loop on the left okay so this come to a knowledge of a silhouette sign okay silhouette sign is basically the um, information that you get um, uh, that border the aerated loops uh, to a certain structure adjacent to that okay for example right upper loop is being margin or being bordered by the transverse fissure and also the upper part of the right radius sinus border whereas the right middle loop has a silhouette with the right heart border so if let's say this outline is being um, uh, obliterated you will know that there is pathology in the right middle loop right lower loop on the other hand has um, a silhouette with the right hemidiaphragm the left up uh, left upper lobe on the other hand because it's big so it occupies almost the whole left um, heart border okay it's been bordered by the almost the whole um, uh, left metacellular border including the left heart border and the left lower lobe is being uh, has the silhouette with the left hemidiaphragm and also the descending uh, the outline of the descending aorta why is this important well whenever you see an opacity um, for example here you know that this opacity is in the right upper lobe because um, it's being bordered inferiorly by the transverse fissure and you do not see the upper part of the right mediastinal border okay it is uh, in the case of uh, consolidation bronchopneumonia uh, most of the time staphylococcus streptococcus they like uh, uh, to go into the right upper lobe and in this case you lost all the delineation of the left medicine border you know that's not the silhouette sign with the left medicine border has lost so that means the pathology or the consolidation is in the left upper lobe okay and in the it's not in the left lower lobe because you'll be still able to see the left hemidiaphragm very well okay this is a bit more subtle but if you apply the principle just now um, you you see that the left heart border is very well delineated but you cannot delineate the right heart border so we know that this consolidation is actually within the right middle lobe because the silhouette between the right middle lobe and the right heart border has lost okay and what about this one you you lost the silhouette or the outline of the left hemidiaphragm so that means the consolidation is in the left lower lobe but at the same time you lost the delineation of the uh, left heart border so that means part of the lower or we call that as in lingual segment of the left upper loop is also affected with the consolidation okay so now now we move on to ground glass opacity so ground glass opacity is basically um, the pathology is in the alveolar as well but the um, the the alveolar is not 100% uh, filled with fluid or pus or black okay so imagine there's a there's a glass of water but it is half full so it's mixed with between the air as well as the fluid or the the pus so that gives rise to a low level of pasty so in this case so it becomes greenish as the same between the black and the white okay gray not the shades of gray all right now um and you you also lost the outlines of the vessel because um, it can obscure the vessel partly all right so this normally happen in respiratory distress syndrome or in the cases of congenital uh, or neonatal pneumonia all right so in respiratory distress, distress syndrome uh, because there's a the pneumatocyte type 2 is still immature especially in a premature baby so the other line would not extend as a normal 
and it will be partially filled, uh, filled with fluid. Okay, so that's how a drunk glass of ice looks like. Okay, whenever there's infection uh, or inflammation, um, so that's why the vessel also cannot be knitted because it also affects the interstitium. Okay, so like in this case, right? So you see, it's a very low level of grey opacity. Okay, compared to um, um, an, an opaque consolidation. Right. So now, um, uh, ring opacity, on the other hand, is basically um, more focal. It can be multiple in the lung, and the pathology is still in the alveoli. And what happened is that um, th this is when you have a, um, uh, a lesion that has a very op has an opaque wall, but within it centrally is loosened. That means there's fluid. Uh, so there's air within that. So then we call that as a ring of pasty. It can be caused by infection that is not. Um, normally cavitate for example in tuberculosis or staphylococcal uh, aureus uh, or it can be presented by a dilated bronchus with a thickened bronchial wall so in a case of bronchitis or in children you have another differential where whereby you see a multiple cavities uh, which represent the um, bowel airfield bowel that give rise to a congenital diaphragmatic hernia i will show you so, if you see this chest x ray can you really uh, pinpoint where is the abnormality? So, let me just make that up. So, the abnormality is in the right upper lobe. Okay, so this is the cavity. Um, uh, most of the time, it is rounded and it is outlined by um, an opaque uh, wall with a loosened center indicating air within. So, it can be abscess, it can be necrotic um, lesions. It can also have an uh, air fluid level within this cavity okay so again it can uh, most of the time be seen in abscesses but if you see cases that have multiple cavities like this okay um, and with an uh, no delineation you can't outline the left family diaphragm and there is evidence of uh, metastinal um, shift to the contralateral side because you can see that the metastinal has gone to the right side uh, indicating some mass effect from these structures. So this is a typical features of a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Often happen in neonates or newborn that uh, when they been delivered and present with shortness of breath, chest actually look like this with all these multiple cavities, no left family diaphragmatic outline, metastinal shape. Think about congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Now we move on to nodules. So nodules is um, more opaque, um, often is rounded um, in appearance in the alveoli. So it has a margin to it. Okay, for example, the case that I showed you just now with the cavity with the air fluid level. Uh, now this patient also have a nodule, a big nodule here. Okay, but it is still rounded and opaque. So whenever this lesion, the the nodule become cavitated. So it can le leads to abscess or cavity thing lesion like this one, okay. So it can be this size, it can be this size, very small, okay. Well, it's very easy if you see this, okay. You have a very rounded, big, um, of varying sizes in a patient with a um, metastatic osteosarcoma, alright. Uh, see that's the um, chemoport line, alright. Compared to this, a very small nodule. So nodule can have uh, varying sizes. It can be big, it can be intermediate, it can be very small like this one. We call this as a miliary nodule in a case of miliary tuberculosis. Okay. Now, now we, we go to a, a more clearer or more bigger lesion. For, uh, so in this case, it's an opaque hemithorax. So open hemithorax is basically as a total whiteout, quite a homogeneous hemithorax. And there is a complementary shift of the metastinum to the contralateral side. Okay, so as I said just now, um, radiographic density it can be fluid, it can be blood, it can be soft tissue. So whenever you see this, the differential would be whether is there a large fluid in the pleura, um, in the case of lymphoma, or it can be a soft tissue, um, for example, in a metastinum mass. Okay. So um, this example of a child being intubated, okay, came in with shortness of breath, very homogeneously opaque um, left hemithorax, metastinal shift, 
Okay, then um, in this case, uh, we have to think about the two different shops. Whether is it a large um, uh, empire mall versus um, a, a, a huge multi-tiny mass. Uh, but we did ultrasound for this case and we saw a solid mass. So on the CT scan, it shows that this is actually a solid mass that coming from the metastinum. So these are the metastinal vessel, okay, the pulmonary artery, uh, right pulmonary trunk and left pulmonary trunk. But in the, uh, the mass coming from the lateral aspect of the left metastinum, uh, solid with calcification with fat component here. So it indicates teratoma. So this is a case of metastinal teratoma. Whereas if you see a loosened hemithorax, so think about presence of air most of the time. Okay. So um, and again it, it implies the same principle as the open hemithorax that is shape of metastinum to the contralateral side. It is that the differential would be different. So if it is loosened air field, so think about air in the pleura in a case of pneumothorax, surgical emergency definitely. Or in children, you can uh, actually think about uh, congenital pulmonary abnormality. For example, air trapping or emphysema in the pulmonary, in an abnormal lung parenchyma, which is congenital. Okay, so like in this case, we have a very opaque, uh, sorry, loosened hemi left hemithorax. Okay, a metastinal shift to the contralateral side, and then you see some linear opacity there that represent the vessel. So you do not see the plural outline that will points towards pneumothorax. So this is um, a case of a congenital pulmonary abnormality. So you can see that you know a very loosened uh, left hemithorax with lines you know that represent the septa, the interlobular septa, uh, in a case of a congenital lumbar Alright. So. I think I've covered all the eight um, radiographic abnormalities. Okay, so um, the approach of um, chest radiograph is by identifying which pattern is this radi radiographic abnormality and you can narrow down the differential based on the radiographic abnormalities. So now I think I will end up with um, maybe five quiz. Um, so this quiz one, you can see that this is a, a chest radiograph of a newborn baby came in with a shortness of breath. So um, identify, so you can see that, you know, you lost the dry metastinal border here. So because the metastinal has been shifted to the contralateral side, so that means this is a loosened hemithorax, okay? Uh, quite a loosened hemithorax, but we do not see a plural lining to suggest a, a pneumothorax. So then think about congenital family abnormality in children, especially in newborn, because it is congenital. So true enough, this case is um, it's actually um, an, a, a big, a huge uh, left lung emphysema. So that's the vessel and also the interlobular septum, the thicken, but uh, in an abnormal lung parenchyma, uh, with the metastinal shift to the right side. So the right lung has been compressed by the hyperinflated, severely hyperinflated um, left lung. Okay, congenital lobe emphysema. So what about this one? So again, the same principle, identify which side of the lung is abnormal. In this case, you see, well, this one looks a bit more opaque than this one. This one a bit more loosened than this one. Well, which side is abnormal? Look at the metastinum. So the metastinum is obviously is being pushed towards the right side. So that means the left lung is abnormal. Okay, and that means the left lung is hyperinflated. Because you can still see vessel running through it. Okay, but... Um, it is more loosened than the right side. Okay, so this is a if I say this is a three years old presented with wheezing after treatment of bronchodilators, which is remains wheezing. So in a emergency setting, if you have this kind of uh, cases, uh, a unilateral hyperinflated lung, think about um, uh, foreign body aspiration. So true enough, this patient had a CT scan, and we saw that there is an obstruction in the airway or in the left main bronchus actually giving rise to a hyperinflated left lung because the, the air in the left lung cannot get out because cannot be exhaled being trapped inside the left lung because of the obstruction in the left main bronchus in this case it's a foreign body aspiration I think it's a peanut it was a peanut 
Okay, what about this one? The all the eight eight the uh, abnormalities. So look at this abnormality. Looks like homogeneous, but it's opaque. So it's a lump into that unilateral opaque lung. Okay, so differential either in pyma or it can be a mass, metastinal mass. So in this case, we did an ultrasound actually before we did a CT scan. So we saw solid lesion, right? <coughs> so in this case, this is um, actually a, a mass that coming from the metastinum. So that's the coronal view. And this is the axial view. You can see that the, this mass is um, rising from the posterior metastinum and um, compressing or displacing the um, metastinal structure, the vessel. You know, this is the arch of aorta to the right side. Um, in a case of a thoracic neuroblastoma. Okay, so when you approach a chest radiogram, um, as I said, go with the opacity or density. So in this case, scrutinize the lung. Well, not too bad. Okay, you can see uh, quite a homogeneous, you know, uh, quite symmetric um, FA lung. But this is abnormal. Okay, and if you can delineate this um, left heart border, left uh, metastinal border, but still there's something here that is overlying it, you cannot delineate the right um, metastinal border at all. Uh, and you see this opacity. So then if you, you, you go with, the, with that, think about a metastinal mass. And uh, metastinal mass, the differential would include um, thymoma, teratoma, the T's, uh, you know, the terrible uh, lymph nodes, um, or the th enlarged thyroid, well, not in this case, definitely. But if you see here, a lobulated opaque um, opacity mass coming from the metastinum, um, and on, in this uh, uh, setting it, on the CT scan, that's the sternum, and this is the um, ascending aorta, and it, the mass is actually anterior because it's pushing the ascending aorta towards the posterior. So this patient actually has a, a, a huge metastin, anterior metastinal mass um, in a case of lymphoma. Okay. Now, uh, my last question. Um, so you can see that this abnormality is in the left uh, hemithorax, um, opaque but not as opaque as the phase three just now. So it can still be fluid. Okay. Uh, you can delineate the right heart, the uh, left heart border here. So we did an ultrasound actually for this case um, and we see that it is a fluid but it's a complex fluid because there is subtation. So this is a typical uh, ultrasound occurrence of an impaima. Um, so when we did CT scan, this patient um, actually has a, a necrotizing pneumonia with uh, a, a pleural impaima in a case of pneumonia with paranormal infusion, which is impaima. Okay. Alright, so I think that's all. Um, uh, we cover almost all the um, basic um, uh, uh, radiological approach um, uh, in a chest radiograph um, uh, pertaining to children because you need to understand from all the lecture that I've given you, uh, some disease are quite unique to children that's not present in adults. So, um, so hope that you, you can um, approach um, chest radiograph after this based on the abnormality that I mentioned, with identify which, which are the abnormalities, think about wh where is the pathology is, and then go with the differential diagnosis. So with that, I thank you.